What's going on, everybody? Uh, welcome back to the channel. Here's a continuation. Here's some more of a uh, Gary Gensler, um, where I guess he he was speaking to a a, a group of people. Uh, apparently, this is from like a few years back when he, before he became um, chair chair of the set. Here you go. Here's some more video footage. Make you wonder. Privacy, data, data ownership, jobs, which was a question that, that was earlier asked even about uh, innovation. Singularity is this idea is what happened when, you know, Hal takes over and it's, you know, it, you remember who Hal was, the computer, yeah. Um, but when Hal takes over. Uh, blockchain technology. Um, I've had the honor to teach about 150 students this year and different, uh, Leonid and I have this course called Crypto Finance right now where we're trying to teach how to value crypto assets. I don't know how we're doing, Leonid. Uh, but um, uh, MIT is a remarkable place. I would say probably somewhere on campus there's 200 to 250 students taking a course somewhere this academic year in blockchain technology. Either. John Williams over in the electrical engineering group actually teaches some programming and Neha Narula and others and then over at Sloan we do our thing maybe it's 250 it's probably 500 to 1000 that take machine learning classes and so forth so I just want to you know scale this stuff but what is blockchain technology it's an innovation at first from the early 1990s two Bell Labs scientists came up with the concept of doing blocks of data using a cryptographic thing called a hash function, a data commitment, and connecting those blocks of data. It's kind of a clunky, harder data structure, but it has better tamper resistance. So you're trading off a little complexity with da data resistance with fingerprinting these blocks of data. In 2008, a paper is written by Satoshi Nakamoto. I have a question. Does anybody know who Satoshi Nakamoto is? I'm sorry. Do you, I want to know because you're going to make you're going to make news, and we're going to we're going to live stream this. He's probably, dead. He's probably dead. So, do you know? You think it's Hal Finney? Is that it? Yeah. Nobody actually knows who Satoshi Nakamoto. Well, maybe maybe uh, my former colleague at Goldman Sachs knows, but Satoshi Nakamoto writes a paper on Halloween night. 2008, in the middle of the financial crisis, I can assure you that most people in finance did not read it at that point in time. But it was right in the middle of the crisis on Halloween and puts it out on a cypherpunk web uh, email list. And I use the word cypherpunk. It was a bunch of cryptographers. Um, but what, what Nakamoto was uh, trying to achieve was a form of currency without a central authority. And at its core, he was trying to solve a riddle that was around for 20 years, and somewhere in the order of 30 to 50 efforts were done to try to do this. Even one or two patents were filed and failed. The idea was, can we move something of value on the Internet? Like we move something of information on the Internet, packets of data on the Internet, can we move packets of data that represent money? That was at its core, with no central authority, with no central bank, no commercial bank, in essence, no central registry or ledger, but a distributed decentralized ledger. And Nakamoto came up with what I'll call Nakamoto consensus, where it could be untrusted, broad consensus. And without going deeper on it, it you can create an auditable database that's tamper resistant. Don't get confused. If somebody says it's immutable, nothing is immutable. Quantum computing could trample this. And well before that, something called 51% attacks can as well. But it's highly tamper resistant, uh, and Bitcoin was its first use case. So what is blockchain? It provides peer-to-peer -peer alternative for computing and moving value. You can actually move value, but you could also store and do computing on it. Ethereum was the, the sort of the next thing that did a bunch of computing on it. It can lower verification and networking costs. And one of our colleagues, Christian Connellini, has written extensively on how it can lower these types of costs of verification and networking. But it comes with complexity. 
and it comes with real governance issues and challenges. So it's not like just you win, you also have to have a trade-off. Um, I think any use case really has to address purpose versus traditional databases. And what you're moving from in a traditional database is you're trusting Facebook or J.P. Morgan or the state government